All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. As always, host Brandon Jim, my co host Dan No Nick. He is still overseas watching Nebraska you lose a very Nebraska style. Horribly, horribly. Oh, to kick off the American good. college football season. But he had a great day out. It looked like he had a great time out, except for the match, which is very typical of most type of sporting events. You don't go knowing or feeling that your team is going to hundred percent win. I mean, unless you're an Alabama fan, pretty much. I mean, that, that's pretty much the, the way it works in college football, but we had to get someone in Brandon to spend some time with us. Someone who could give us a little bit of a feel for what it was like to be there yesterday as Chelsea claimed all three points and it's Ollie Glanville back again, joining us. And we're so excited you're here. Thanks man. Yeah. Pleasure to join you as always. Oh, it is going to be good in case you are still confused what we're doing. This is the Leicester City match review. All right. This is uh, the one where Chelsea foiled the Foxes with Tuchel watching in the stands. That pesky little touchline ban that really didn't mean a whole lot. Uh, and thanks to superb performances, Raheem Sterling, Tiago Silva, and many others, which we'll touch on, uh, the return of Trevo Chalaba in the lineup and his future crystallizing after another strong outing from the young man. And then with questions still needing answers ahead of the transfer window closing, we tackle a few of our own. So uh, to kick it off, Dan, we always want to temp check. What are the lovely people out there saying with our patented three-word match review? Patented, trademark, registered, copyrighted. It's here. It's a three-word match review. And look, Janique got us started with gritty three points, which had to throw a little gritty gift back at her for that. The Beltway Blues with 10 men win. She talks ball, good friend Rada with the win for women. Obviously, the Chelsea women were all out and about in Stanford, in and around Stanford Bridge yesterday. And there were plenty of photos of them enjoying the match and uh, seemingly trying to figure out why it's so hard for the men's team to score. You had AJ with bubble wrap, Tiago, agree, cosine. Aaron with the overcoming obvious obstacles. We love a little alliteration here. Jason with the who needs 11 question mark. Jay with the Fafana might have helped. Mark with the Silva fucking everywhere. McLeasy with the big Trev energy. And then Bill of Rights with the season starts all red. E. Get it, red? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, bummer for for big old con dog there. I put team overcomes inexperience. Pretty obvious there. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, thankfully, no huge loss uh, for Connor, but definitely his moment made it far more difficult. But it might have actually invigorated the team a little bit. Ironically, uh, Dan, what about you? I well, I, I said thanks to Wes, but thank you, Wes, because this game would have been way more difficult if they had one more competent defender in the lineup and. They did not. So let's just take advantage of what we did. Let's not focus too much on what could have gone differently and run forward with three points into next the next match. All right, Ollie, what about you? Uh, I went with uh, Reese's uh, Sterling Silver. So you got the three best players on the pitch. You got the silver service that Reese provided for the uh, second goal there. And just the fact that, yeah, those three just kind of dominate proceedings, really. I mean, yesterday, absolutely hard to overcome anything that those three did and we're going to be diving way more into them uh but before we do we have some thank yous dan when people help us we show our, we show our respect our gratitude yes uh gratitudes followed by platitudes we want to thank lee and needy on patreon for helping follow us and support us give us a little extra funding to do uh tons of cool stuff and we we appreciate that on apple podcast eggy spy from the uk and then crawford sawyer from the uk leaving wonderful five-star reviews on apple Podcasts. We really appreciate that helps people find the show let them know that we're your favorite chelsea podcast and then on spotify still to 4.9 over 1300 reviews and uh just pushing towards that 1400 barrier so let's uh bust through that as Chelsea close out the transfer window, hopefully in phenomenal fashion. And yeah, it helps people find us too. So leave a review, ask a friend to leave a review, borrow a buddy's phone, don't steal it, borrow it, give it back and leave a review. It's really appreciated. We'll uh, get into match details now, Brandon, because that's what we do. That's what we're here to do. All right, well, let's go ahead and dive into the match. Uh, before we get into the analysis, we want to set the stage per usual. So it was Leicester City this past Saturday, the 27th of August. It was in the Premier League at Stamford Bridge. Uh, in case you missed it, Chelsea 2, Leicester City 1. Goals coming from Raheem the Dream Sterling in the 47th and 63rd minute. Not much 
time had passed. And then Harvey Barnes with a bit of a scare, 66 minute. Uh, I know they hit the post a couple of times, but that is how it stands. Ollie, you being inside El Estadio de Stanford Bridge, what was it like in there? We know we've had some mixed results. It's been a little bit up and down. You know, Koulibaly was going to miss, uh, but it looked like the weather was there. So I feel like the fans were going to be up for it. Yeah, you know, we're always up for uh, a bit of sun in London. Um, climate change means it's more and more often. <laughs> and it was uh, it was pretty hot there, actually. Um, and it's we started like a proverbial house on fire, to be honest. I mean, the the first yellow for, for Connor was kind of more about the, the freneticism in the middle of the pitch. The midfield was just kind of, you know, flying around all over the shop. And uh, that kind of filtered into the crowd. And obviously, uh, we'll come on to the goals. But uh, once that first goal goes in, the, the roof came off and the second one as well. So uh, it's, yeah, we bounced off each other nicely, I think. Good. Love to hear it. It's always good when we get the uh, the perspective from inside the stadium, which is the one thing we never get. So we appreciate uh, you sharing that. All right. Before we jump into the lineup, we're going to head over to the fifth stand up for the official Chelsea FC highlights. Yes, that's right. They share the highlights with us. And in turn, we promote if you've not downloaded the official Chelsea FC app, the fifth stand up. Go to it now. Tons and tons of content coming during and right after the match. So here we go. All right. Well, now that we relived uh, a bit of a dramatic yet fun match dan uh lineup time look we saw three four three we saw four three three this is saying four four two no one really knows how about you just tell us who is out there and we'll figure it out it's, it's a very fluid thing it is a very fluid thing the lineup is there to help get 11 names on a sheet once it actually is in practice and practicality all rules are off particularly with a midfield that we had yesterday. Um, but anyway, it was that one many between the sticks, Trev Chalba, Thiago Silva, Reese James, and Mark Kukurea as your defenders in the midfield. Midfield, again, quotation marks. Jorginho, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Mason Mount, and Connor Gallagher, who did see a early red card. We had Raheem Sterling and Kai Havertz as your attackers on there. Keppa, Ethan Ampadu, Hakim Ziyech, Mondo Brogia, and Calum Hudson-Joy, unused substitutes, and Ben Chilwell, as for Kletza, Mateo Kovacic, and Christian Pulisic, all making appearances off the bench. Well, again, Ali, before the match, we were talking, is Reese right back? Is he right center back? It all was very fluid. I mean, like I said, no matter what source you had, what was your kind of take on the lineup and, and maybe what the formation was? And, or does it even matter? Shane is screaming right now, it doesn't matter. But <laughs> tactics alone, there is a little bit of, of value there. To me, it was actually really interesting. Um, you know, obviously we had our hands kind of tied with uh, Kalidou out, um, a few injuries going around, obviously no Kante, cover, two calls that can only play 20 minutes, right? So it was going to be a bit patchwork, but we could see that it was going to be four. And then as the game kicked off, we looked like kind of 4-4-2 four, four, out of possession, 4-2-4 four, four in possession at some points. It was like 4-1-5. Um, we'll say euphemistically it was it was dynamic right <laughs> in, in, in midfield we, we we were seeing uh tiago underlapping uh Kukurea at times and actually like taking up a kind of left wing role almost trev was pushing up as well so in possession we were kind of very fluid i'll say it's the type of system that you would work on in pre-season um we did not have that potentially long preseason that other, others have had. And that kind of showed in the in the game yesterday. I feel like a lot of teams are going to come away from playing this lesser side without any reinforcements, and they're going to have a lot of work to do, and feeling like it was a preseason match, to be fair. All right. Well, um, on that note, some of the match stats <laughs> from this one. Uh, Chelsea actually with only 45% possession at home, which is very odd. But there's a there's a stat at the end here that might uh, determine why that was. Uh, we had seven shots, three on target. So at least our on target shot ratio taking a big jump up. Leicester, they did manage 17 shots, five on target, which is usually the opposite. That's usually what we're seeing on the Chelsea line. Um, again, we were, had less touches, had less passes, things that are very you know not normal for this side. Uh, we had 18 tackles there, 17, 25 clearances to their 14, definitely under the cosh a little bit. We only had three corners. They had 11 
three offsides there. One, a yellow card for us, two for them, and the lone red card going to Connor Gallagher in the first half. We conceded 10 fouls to their seven. Uh, and then the last fun stat here would be the XG. Uh, so from the analyst, we had Chelsea to Leicester City one, and the total being uh, Chelsea 1.67 to 2.12 for Leicester City. Uh, which means we had to defend for our lives a little bit today, and they did just that. So, um, again, uh, team effort on this one. Had to grind, had to grit through a lot of this, uh, but got it done. And the end pet shit house moment of the match, while we don't have Nick, Ollie, a bit of a shout here, don't you? I do. Um, so, for those who couldn't hear at home, uh, Leicester City fans were chanting Ben Chilwell. He sits on the bench um, for as long as the game as they possibly could. And then when he came off the bench, um, he gave a bit back with a kind of gesture to the Leicester fans as he came on the pitch. So that was nice to see. Ah, uh, lo- old loves showing up again in your life and and how we treat them is, is a little bit different for everybody, but love that Chili B is, is up to it. it. Really no surprise there whatsoever. Uh, one random stat coming from Ad Opta Joe saying three. Raheem Sterling is the third player in Premier League history to score for each of Man City, Liverpool, and Chelsea after one Nicolas Anelka and Daniel Sturridge. Absolute company. So uh, I would definitely go out to dinner with Anelka over Sturridge. Nothing against him. I've just seen the Anelka kind of documentary on Amazon. Man, that dude is an interesting cat. So <laughs> uh, miss those days. Uh, anyways, we're about to jump into it. Before we do, we're going to take our quick ad break and get out of the way. So huge shout out to the sponsors for Financially Sporting the Show. And we'll be right back. All right, Dan, as we flip out of the, the ad break, we do have a lot more content coming, everybody. My plug is just that we still have some shirts left, Chaos and Trophies. If you don't believe that Chelsea are all about Chaos and Trophies, it's in our DNA. Look at the beginning of the season and our preseason. So anyways, shirts are in stock. Hit us up on the website. Uh, I'll get them shipped out this week. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good shout. I do think this is the year that the Chelsea women's team are going to win the Champions League. So I think this is a perfect time to pick up a shirt ahead of that because that's the direction we're heading. And it's all going to be on the back of Lauren James continuing to fly extremely high, Ollie, as uh, you and I were texting this morning as the uh, the match was going on U.S. time and afternoon U.K. time. Yeah, she's uh, she's feeling, I think, in herself, but also those watching are feeling like this is uh, going to be a huge year for Lauren. Uh, once again, scoring in preseason against Spurs uh, earlier. And um, yeah, just... She makes it look so easy. Um, she's so hard to take off the ball. And her left foot is great. So there's, there's a lot to look forward to. She has such a high ceiling, just like Reese. And uh, yeah, long live the James dominance in terms of England as well. They've got a going to be a record-breaking brother and sister coming up in the national break. Odds are massive uh, on that. So anyways, yeah, go check out Blue Royalty covering the women's team every single week. Uh, Jesse Abdullah, Nick, and rotating guests. So anyways jumping into the analysis side of this one uh the first point i want to talk about like we said was the fact that Chelsea chelsea foiled the foxes thank you dan for making that simple on me uh thanks to sterling silva and others so it look it had all the hallmarks of a bad day out first half was miserable connor picked up an early yellow and then somehow after a, a terrible uh corner set piece uh he ended up being the last man back and just innately he was like oh i need to stop this counter forgetting probably forgetting he was on the yellow uh so he got a second yellow down a man almost an hour to play down but 10 players is all it took for chelsea to ruin lester's day in london and uh at times at least me personally dan i forgot Chelsea were down to 10 players. I At times, I forgot that it wasn't full strength. Uh, the times I remember that is when we would put our foot on the ball, stop, let Re- Lester retreat, and then take a breath and relax and then decide what we want to do. Yeah, we had, we had a lot of opportunity to reload in this match, which doesn't feel like you should be able to do when you're playing down. There was the initial chaos that transpired after we scored and like you know that that was kind of a moment we just kind of sunk our heads but then also like after connor was sent off there was the oh shit we're gonna have to try to deal with this now for the remainder of the match and credit to the entire side for banding together in that moment because we have seen in the past that this team can lose their heads a little bit but they were able to galvanize really quickly and figure out okay here's here's how we're going to be able to beat them And it goes back to 
how we've talked about how this team can actually play every time and not have to play this expansive style of football or maintain all the possession, that this team is actually really, really well built to take advantage of quick action on counters and to move the ball forward. And having, you know, we talk about having possession for possession's sake doesn't really do anything. But boy, oh boy, when you have someone like Raheem Sterling who can beat a defender in a foot race, Ali, and can pull off two really good shots and put them through, probably should have had a hat trick as well. Just a really, really nice initial couple of games for him. And to finally see him get two in this match, I think is a testament to what he's going to bring, why he's the right fit for this attack. And the fact that I think, you know, from an talent ID standpoint, we got this signing really, really right. Yeah. Like breaking news down. um, If you put a threatening player in and around the box, who's competent uh, finishing wise, he's going to score goals. Right. Um, (laughs) We've, uh, we've operated under this, like, false illusion recently that um you don't have to have players in the box in order to score goals and that kind of manifested in our in our front three for a lot of the game yesterday when we were drifting out wide in order to create but not having anyone in the middle to finish and it was it you know Raheem basically took it on himself to first he uh with the first goal that was deflective it was beautiful to watch especially from my angle is right <laughs> right in line with it uh, and then the second one's just, it's such a simple goal, but we just don't see it at this club very often. We haven't seen it since maybe, you know, early Tammy, Diego, Didier, just in that area. And um, what uh, what Richard Amalfa calls the gold mine at the back post there. <laughs> G-O-A-L-D mine. Uh, just because that's where the tap-ins are, right? That's where the easy goals are. High XG numbers, right? And um, we're so, so happy for Raheem yesterday. He's coming in as the main man now. um, And this is going to really, really help him in that regard. You could see in the celebration for the first one, especially just how much of a kind of weight off his back it was. You know, things weren't kind of working out for him uh, luck-wise early season. And now these two goals are going to... The first one was like, you know, great, I've got my goal. The second one was, this is me, I'm here. Love that analysis. Um, you know, he'd been knocking on the door all season, right? And uh, has an assist. Now he has the two goals to back it up, uh, especially in a moment. And I think Tuchel said, you know, he essentially told Raheem, he's like, we're, we need you. We're relying on you. Like, go do it. And and he did the business. He's able to to step up. You know, Dan, it is nice when you can quantitate some of the, the value that a player adds. And uh, while Raheem definitely passed the eye test, um, the different things and parts of the match that he was involved in, I think really shows maybe like just how uh, versatile of a player he is. You know, you always think of him as just probably someone who hangs out around the half line waiting to, you know, hit on the break or always in around the opponent's box. But um, this, this guy is committed to, to seems like the team tactics based on, based on what we see here. Uh, he had three shots. He had two on target and he scored two goals. And that was above the expected goal total that he's deliver so would and i would argue three if it weren't for wards would toe. have scored three yeah ward had a really really fantastic save on him i think in the moment when you were watching it live you're like oh, how, how did he miss that come on but when you go back and watch it you're like damn this is why ward is starting for them <laughs> even though they're a terrible team ward actually had a really good display in that regard and, and the other goals were just perfectly worked moved at pace moved quickly quick transition, great crossing in, arriving on the ball and not having to do much with it, which is something we have struggled to do and uh, making sure that the, it's so fast that you can't respond to it. This is something we got, you know, we're able to do effectively. And I worry that as we think about the next few matches, getting some players back healthy, if we go back to tons of possession and making itself it really difficult on ourselves, that we won't benefit from the same level of, quick movement, quick engagement, and putting ourselves in a position to take advantage of Raheem's, you know, his skill set, his ability to play in this way. And you know, I think the stats you were mentioning, Squawka had it with uh, 1.15 XG. I also saw 1.3 elsewhere, 37 touches, three touches in the box, three shots, three duels, one, two fouls, one, two shots on targets, two goals, and one chance created, which uh, are all things that you should be excited about, Ollie. Absolutely, man. And, uh, you know, we'll probably come on to it, but that Reese uh, Raz partnership is 
something that's uh, you know really really encouraging to watch. We talk about um, in preseason how you know <laughs> for Man City it's such an easy game because they have so many easy repeatable actions. Yeah. That second goal is something we can do so so many times this season. You know, Reese is going to put it on a plate for him. Raheem is going to be there to tap in. We can just keep going and going with that. It's the uh, the move that gets spammed, like when you're playing a fighting game or something. You set, you tap someone into a corner, and you're like, "Please stop doing this!" Like it's so lame that you're doing that. I don't care. I will take that move every single game, three or four times. Win one nil, two nil. The rest of the season, I will take that all the way to the bank. Like, let's see the Reese James Raz partnership. And I think you know maybe just kind of talking about Reese and Kukurea for a second. Brandon, I think both of them, Reese in particular, who at moments, particularly in that first half, got into his like Hulk out, like, fuck it, I'm just going to do this myself when we were going through a little period of instability, but then also being able to combine, you know, cross it in from the right in the second half of the match, just showing his versatility, showing why being able to play right wing right with the right wing back role for the remainder of the season versus having to play a right back position is going to be really beneficial for us too well i mean look i'm on pretty public record about what i think really? should be should a podcast or something reese's uh, look it's on tiktok so you know it's really uh official um of, of just where i see reese being successful you know i i, I don't like um, you know, us having to marginalize his abilities uh, by putting him at right center back and waiting until the 60th minute to ru- move Ruben in and then move him up because he's just so devastating from the beginning, whether it's right back or, you know, right wing back. We can see what he has to do. And look, I don't think it's below the fold here that we should talk about his hairstyle. The guy has swag and confidence. And that is translating to the field. I mean, guys, it wasn't that long ago that I remember Lee Parker grabbing Reese James after some of his first minutes for like the first team, like three seasons ago. He was so quiet. He was so shy. Couldn't get anything out of him. Now when Reese walks onto the pitch, he's a stone cold killer. He has all the confidence in the world and his abilities and in this game. He's going to, whatever happens, he's going to take it on the chin. He's going to deal with it. He's going to drive the team forward because he just, knows that he belongs there and he's going to go make an impact and like we're starting to see a little bit of of style from him which is great that we got the substance first and now the style and and he's growing into himself and i'm so excited to see like where reese james grows as a player because a he's not done and he's already terrorizing people um so yeah look put put him at right wing back gets an assist weird also, Kukurea, which we'll get on later, out on the wing, gets an assist. Wing backs FC. That is the team. They have We're to back, be baby. at their We're prime back. under Tuchel to be successful. And Reese James is one of the best in the business. And the less he plays at right wing back, the more it sucks for us. And hopefully, you'd assume that Fofana unlocks the right wing back, clears day for Reese. Is that suck for Ruben? Of course. He'll figure it out. He's a professional with a lot of different talents and, and abilities. So he'll he'll be just fine. Wow. I mean, you just shocked us in the silence there for a moment. I hope that Jake does not edit it out fully for the gasp there that we had to put in. But I think as we kind of talk about the that back half of the pitch, you know, our defense, because we were doing a lot of that defending. I think, you know, as uh, John Terry put it in his tweet, I fucking love this man with the quote tweet of Chelsea's video about the new or current Mr. Chelsea, Tiago Silva. Ali, uh, he's a fan favorite. He's the individual that people wish we had him five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, that we've had a ch- we could have had a chance to watch him play for our side more. But yesterday on uh, what I dubbed as half a hamstring for the last part of the match, that he was able to pull out some really impressive just individual moments of brilliance that kept Chelsea in it and allowed us to with 10 men feel like it was 11 again right yeah I mean um when we went down to 10 it was like the back three and and uh Reese especially just said fine I'll do it myself and just kind of puffed out their chest and said you know we are going to be 11 men whether you like it or not 
Um, I think Opta will have to check this, but I think Thiago Silva blocked or stops uh, the ball with every single part of his body. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday there was, I think uh, there were about three or four duels with um, uh, Keenan Jisby Hall and uh, uh, Harvey Barnes there on the left wing for, for Leicester, where he just kind of stood up with them on the halfway line and said, go on, beat me. And these are like, you know, these are dynamic guys. They they got they got a uh, pace to burn really, and uh, he's just there fronting it up, going, "Go on, try and beat me!" And every single time, just outsight them. And uh, not to, you know, go on about the leadership that he offers as well. Just uh, kind of geeing up the fans as well, uh, especially when they had corners or when we we had like last man blocks stuff like that. But yeah, um, you say that fans wanted him four or five years ago and obviously so many of us did but it already feels like he's been here 10 years man like it, it literally feels like he's always been a Chelsea player and there's something about signing for Chelsea is you know the, the best signings for Chelsea sign for the club right they don't sign for the team they sign for the club and when you buy into that it's magical like imagine being PSG embedding against Thiago Silva. And that set us up for immense success because he came in with a massive chip on his shoulder with so much to prove, um, you know, even to, to PSG and, and other people maybe didn't want him. It, it just, it fell into place so nicely and it, it is just kind of wild, but it's like they awoke the beast in Thiago and I'm sure he's probably working harder now than what he was, you know, four or five years ago, uh, partially because he's, kind of realizing he's human not really but you know because he wants to prove people wrong if you doubt uh an, a, a player with elite mentality that tiago silva has remember we're talking about brazil captain been in world cups been in copa americas uh you know been in Serie A, been in league on champions league after champions league i mean this guy it, there's a reason that he's been so successful at the absolute highest of highest levels and imagine like questioning his mentality <laughs> He's a mentality monster. Uh, and you see that the expected Chelsea's. I mean, you said, talked about it. Five tackles, four clearances, four loose ball recoveries, uh, two block shots, four out of five aerial duels, one five out of five ground duels, one huge display. Copy, paste. Again, Dan, he, I think even in this photo, we see him grabbing his hamstring a little bit. Uh, definitely at the end of the game, you know, I don't know if he's time wasting or what, but he was scaring the absolute life out of all of his Chelsea fans being like, no, your hamstring is fine, Tiago. And that, that's why we included AJ's three word match review. We need to bubble wrap him. We need to put him in plaster. We need to make sure that in between the matches, he goes into whatever regimen it is that keeps him healthy for the remainder of the season because there will be matches that he will not play this season. It's just the nature of being an older, older player and conditioning. And so there will be times we need to do without him the remainder of the season. I do not look forward to those times. I enjoy the times that we do get to watch him on the pitch. And, you know, let's just say if this were his last season or his kind of last rodeo here, as we think about like the future, as we talk about maybe other defenders stepping up, other defenders coming in, what a joy to have had him for this period. And we should, as fans, just appreciate the fact that he's here now in the moment and enjoy what he's doing for us to help us push forward you know, we talk a lot about Asby, what he's done in terms of his leadership and his ability to galvanize the, the team and supporters and make sure that we kind of worked our way through a really tough period. You know, Thiago Silva is part of that too. Thiago Silva is part of that fabric. He's part of the tapestry. He's part of the story of Chelsea. And now he will have been a part of that, helping us transition into reclaiming a championship identity going back to being the best of Europe, going back to, or going to, and for the first time being Club World Cup champions, like Thiago Silva is a massive part of Chelsea history now in such a short period of time. And that is a very, very hard thing to do and just speaks out especially as a player. Well, look, backline dominance. Can't follow that up. I know, I know. Back, look, I'm trying to silence. I'm connecting it. Backline dominance, right? <laughs> is is the key that we've talked about even to this season you know nick nick has been talking about hey roll it back like defend way more and then we can go forward a little bit less like let's let's clean it up in the back obviously keeping tiago healthy is a huge part of that you know fofana coming in reese james going to right wing back kukurea kind of starting to find his rhythm again within the chelsea team uh even though we've 
I think what played two to three different formations potentially in the last couple of matches as well. So like, there's still a lot of changes that are happening. Uh, but another change that we inserted was Trevo. Trevo came back into the back line for um, reasons not in his control, but Hey, last season availability was his best ability and he seized on it. And here we go again, Trevo back in the, in the lineup defending great. Uh, and Dan, if you'd like to sing the lyrics here, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I don't, I don't do singing on this show, but well, what I will say well, is you wrote that... lyrics. So, <laughs> well, I, I, I do Trev is back, back again, defending great, tell a friend. I mean, to no surprise, <laughs> Trev is back in the lineup and he is looking good in that role. Again, he's got a great range of passing distribution. He's very tidy on it. Look, does he occasionally get beat because he's a little younger and trying something maybe a little bit more experimental? Sure, but you know what? He didn't have to do with, deal with Thomas Tuchel yelling him at, at him on the sideline for, for 45 minutes in this match. And so that was something that probably benefited him because he could figure out a little bit on, a, on his own. He gets to work alongside again, Tiago Silva, who we just waxed politically about. He has the opportunity to work with Reese as well, someone he has played with uh, a fair bit of time before, not even this last season, but uh, kind of in the uh, youth academy setup as well. And so, you know, in general, this lots of things to be excited about because I think that, you know, Naz tweeted this right before we kind of started, but that Chelsea have told Trev Chalaba that they want him to stay and he's happy to fight for his place. He had big interests. We saw many, many clubs being associated with him, even Spurs saying like, Hey, oh, please. We'll, 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 yeah, totally. Yeah. Hand raised. We will absolutely find a way to fit him in our team saying just how good he is. Um, but he's been told he is a part of the short and long-term future, despite the imminent signing of Wesley Fofana. And I think that is something, Ali, that as supporters, it's a feel-good storyline as we see, even though we're bringing in extremely talented young players across Europe, whether that's within the academy system or in the first team setup, that we're still finding a way to keep some of these players in the squad happy committed and motivated which i don't think we've always nailed that mixture this is a really good signing i think that's going to portend what what is to come with chelsea right yeah i mean it's it's absolutely for the future i mean you think of three players currently on our books or well, not as we speak but hopefully by the end of the day wesley Fafana, uh trevor chalaber and levi colwell back that's a like world-class back three for the next decade right You've got versatility all across the back. Trev can play in midfield as well. Um, you know, Trev started this match at right centre back. He ended the match at left centre back in a back three. So that you know, this the versatility is obvious. Um, and again, you know, we haven't lost with this guy. Like every game he starts, we don't lose. The only time we've we've lost with Trev is is on penalties, and he scored the penalty he had to take in that shootout. So you know, it, it's not it's not this guy's this guy's issue. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a it's such a good like good news story in terms of how we've brought this back from the the brink and convinced him to stay and the pathway is there and yeah hopefully you know sense has been seen now and we can value these players appropriately because if Trev is on the market and and we're looking at him uh, in terms of versatility and a, a DM option we'd have to pay through the nose to get him. So, you know, value what you've got, you know? It's It's got to be important, you know, that that's taken into consideration. Look, a concern I think that has to be addressed is even in the current squad, is he, if Fofana comes in, which I think we can all assume is going to happen. I mean, he was tweeting goodbye, essentially, and like things like that. I mean, it is confirmed. Um, is Trev two or three in the depth chart? Aspie's still there. Right. Um, you know, what was the conversation they had with him to get him to resign? Uh, that's kind of my concern at, at this point. I know we're going to play 60 games, but to have three right center backs, knowing that Trevo is behind an almost world record signing. I'm sorry, he's not behind, but he's in the mix with a, a near world record signing and the club captain who has just celebrated his birthday and his 10 year anniversary. The deck, the deck is a little stacked against him. And I would like to think that Trevo is in front of Aspie for future and long-term plans, but we've ruled Aspie out before and he's made us look like fools. So anyways, Ollie, uh, what, I mean, concerns with that thoughts, how does that play out? I think, yeah, I think again, like Dan was mentioning that, um, you know, 
uh, Thiago was playing with up to and including half a hamstring at, at points yesterday and, and just playing through the thing, right? And five subs is back this season. <laughs> uh, we need to be really intelligent with how we use our older players. Uh, once again yesterday, you know, we had 10 men on the field and the subs came in super late. Like we had we had one sub at halftime with, with Mace, um, with Mace going off. And then we waited a, like a long, long time uh, before Pooley came on for fresh legs. And essentially Tuchel kind of just said, we're going to abandon the middle third, just, you know, you guys stay up and we're going to have this like pivot and then the five behind. And it that's why Leicester were encouraged on to us. So, I mean, Trev's going to have to, going to have to come in uh, and he should come in. <laughs> you know, Asby cannot play every game. Uh, Tiago cannot play every game. Kaladu cannot play every game. These are all people who need to be swapped in and out intelligently. So again, I think I think Trev's versatility really plays into that, and he's going to be a really useful asset. And, and when you look at the fact that last season, you know, he had twenty two hundred plus minutes across all competitions. It's thirty matches played, twenty four matches started. I wouldn't be surprised if he matched or exceeded that this season, even with Fafana coming in. If any one of our defenders ends up getting injured, I think he's an immediate backfill for Kaladu, most likely, even though you have uh, Kukurea now who could play that left center back role. I think you're going to want to try to keep both him and Chilwell as healthy as possible and institute a little bit more rotation between them and try to save that usage in the back three as a last resort type of thing. Because we saw, and as we talked about earlier, Brandon, we are wing back FC. It does not work if you do not have healthy wing backs. And so you don't want to potentially risk, you know, Chilwell being out injured or, you know, Kukurea being out injured for any period of time because you're playing them both every single match. Maybe if Kaladu's out, you would rather have, Trev on the left or work something else out to ensure that you get him rotated in, you keep other players healthy. And I think Trev is going to get a lot of opportunity. I would say up to, up to and right before the world cup, I think there's going to be a lot of players who are probably trying to figure out how they play 60 minutes. No. Okay. Hey, we, I think we got this unlocked. Can I maybe get subbed out because I'm going to the world cup. I'm about to play for my team. I'd really like to win. Um, is there any chance I can be the first one off the pitch today? We've got a lot of players in our squad that are going to the world cup that have massive aspirations and you are fooling yourself. If they are not having that conversation about their own personal health and well being and how they're used, even though they want to win with the team, they also want to win for the country as well. And they're going to be advocating for themselves and players like Trev are going to be the beneficiary in terms of minutes because of that. Look, the, the, the point about no more midweek breaks, no more six days between matches uh, from now to the world cup that, that definitely changes things. You know, your Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday uh, back and forth is, is definitely going to stretch some players and, and they're going to have to see, I mean, COVID just got, uh, about 15, 20 minutes uh, for the first time, which is good to see. He was happy to run. He was running everywhere. He, you could tell he was so glad to be back on. Uh, you know, and there's going to be moments that the players are going to have to come in and, and do a job. So to I guess to that point, you know, there's going to be opportunities. We just have to see who's available throughout the those days and how Tuchel and his team manages the the players based on, you know, who we're playing and kind of who's coming up next because, you know, it's, Leicester City today, down to 10 men, probably wasn't their plan playing Southampton on Tuesday, uh, who are now not the only team in the nine nine nil club. So good, good, uh, good on them. Um, next up, uh, there's there's still a lot of speculation at the transfer window. You know, we've been bringing on Matt Law, and Naz, even Adam Newson, trying to keep a pulse on everything that's going as best we can. Did you guys see the clip of the fan yelling at Todd Bully yesterday? Oh gosh! Look, you know, shoot your you shot. Have a seat. Is that really what you want to do with your seat? <laughs> he might not have a seat any longer. <laughs> Long story short, some fan was above the owner's box and yelled down to Todd, "Don't sign Gordon. He's shit." 
and I'm not co-signing that. I'm just relaying the message to which you saw Todd kind of look around. Essentially, it was like, can someone take care of that? Because we actually have a plan here that we're operating on. Uh, I just hope that plan doesn't include Connor and Broya uh, to Everton for Anthony Gordon. Um, but anyways, there's still a few days left in the transfer window. Is Fofana looks likely. United sniping in a bombing. So we've got a few things we can talk about here uh, to really talk about how this team can round themselves out and be ready to take four competitions plus managing World Cup expectations on this season, which is a first for everybody. So Fafana Medical happening at the time of recording. Seemingly, our defense is settled for the window. Uh, anyways, I, I think that this is also announced that Ampadu is looking likely that he's going to leave permanently, question mark. Um, so yeah, I mean, Dan Fofana coming in, we talked about that depth chart, maybe a little light at left center back. Obviously they signed Kukure for that flexibility to go between left wing back and left center back. Um, and, and if, uh, Trevo, you know, starts to learn from Tiago Silva about that sweeper role, you know, now we're kind of a little bit more balanced, but I mean, the Fofana was, is I'm, I'm missing it, but you guys tell me that he is the bee's knees. So I'm just going with that. I, I feel like I have to, even though you threw it to me, I have to cede it to Ali because he has been ready to talk about Fafana and been bursting at the seams to do so. So uh, I, I will uh, yield the floor to uh, the wonderful uh, individual from the UK who's joining us on this podcast. So I cede my time. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, what I would say is, <laughs> yeah, no, for, for me, Wesley um, is probably one of the one of the best uh, young center backs in the world right um the the fee we're paying seems high and even though it seems like the fee is going to be paid next year instead of this year um he he offers like such a wide variety of skills that's so rare in a center back you know ball carrying ability you know we we talked about kunde being that that um kind of playmaker almost from right center back Fafana offers offers you that in abundance. He has that passing range. He has the height which Kunde doesn't have. But you know more than that. It's just it's just the fact that he's just of a level already, and he's all he's going to, you know, get to that world class stage, you know, within a couple of years. So it's it's just such an exciting uh, signing. It also frees up Reese James as a right wing back, and if that's not worth you know, 70 odd million in itself, uh, freeing up your kind of best attacker in our current squad, then I don't know what is. That that to me is the underline of yes, 100%. Would you say paying, you know, 45 million would be good for Fafana and then another 30 million to have Reese not have to play right center back? Yeah, I think we could all get behind that in terms of the structure about thinking about it. And look, they're, we still massively underpaid for Conte. So, like, I mean, look, Leicester, Leicester is coming to, to get a little help right now. They're in massive financial straits at the moment, and they can use every little bit of an investment. And so I don't besmirch them at all for how tough they had been in negotiating this and not making this easy on Chelsea in terms of getting a deal across the line. But when you think about the fact now, Tuke will not be forced to play as Quetta with a regular light regularity, but can potentially use him more selectively, which will keep him fresher, keep him someone who can kind of rotate in to spell uh, West for a game, to spell Reese for a moment. You have Ruben, who has shown an effectiveness within that right wing back role. So now what you're doing by adding someone here is you're creating the depth that you were not showing that you had the ability to take advantage of heading into these first couple matches of the season. And also, uh, Wes just offers you that versatility as well, right? You know, he's played throughout his his young career at San Etienne and at Leicester, all the way across the back in the back three or in, in the two uh, as part of the four. So it's much like Trev, right? You're future-proofing, but also you're giving yourself those options at the back for Tuchel to use this season. Youth and versatility, pretty much the, the ideal player uh, in this one. Uh, and then linked to that, probably, and I think Ampadu's probably been looking at this for a while, uh, Fabrizio Romano, 
uh, tweeted that Spezia are set to sign Ethan Ampadu from Chelsea. Ben told deal is now progressing to the signing stage. More details on deal structure to follow. Ampadu's agreed personal terms and full agreement between clubs in place. And that's Spezia Calcio. And if they hurry up, they can sign him before they play Juventus on the 31st of August. But I don't know if, how well that's going to work out. But look, Ethan, after his, his uh, loan of Venezia, knows Serie A. He's probably looking at Fick and, and um, excuse me, Tammy. Uh, and saying, wow, you're having a lot of success in, in Italy. I was there last season, played a lot of minutes. Let's go back. And that seems to be kind of the the play for him. Obviously, he's going to make decisions uh, wholly based on his ability to be primed and ready for the World Cup uh, for Wales. So uh, losing him, it's a bummer. Uh, but again, it just no matter the situation, nothing really seemed to click for him. So this might be a good chance for him to hit reset and, and, and get minutes and f- make a home for himself. Because like I said, it's worked so well for, uh, you know, the, the other guys he's grown up playing with. So uh, the attack is a big part as we've talked about. I know we, we scored an amazing two goals yesterday, but we don't always do that. So uh, attack seems like the area Chelsea looked most likely to reinforce next since Tuchel ruled out any midfield signings to my massive dismay uh but we're seeing like stalling of the incomings and outgoings you know um what are we doing with Ziyech uh Pulisic I think he's settled maybe a little bit we're not really sure uh but here we go Aubameyang not happening is happening not sure so surprise Wilfred Zaha Ali is now the new one that we've seen being linked with Chelsea yeah I mean Name a year where he hasn't been linked with Chelsea is uh, is my my counter to that. Um, you're talking about a player who, like before he moved to United, was was linked to Chelsea. So that's how, like, if you remember that, how many years back that was. Um, the idea that he would play through the middle is quite confusing to me. Where you know Crystal Palace, his team, have signed nines uh, that they would prefer to play through the middle as well. Um, in terms of a dynamic. A dynamic forward yeah great um he would absolutely suit that style i really like him when he's on song um he does have a habit of digging out his own teammates a bit too much which is <laughs> slightly toxic for my liking but um yeah if you if you're going for a profile like zaha there is a younger i would say more talented uh portuguese player that's um playing with Fick at the moment that you might want to look out for um uh, maybe take the is Gordon that leo's fee. music <laughs> <laughs> maybe you take the Gordon fee, the Aubameyang fee and kind of pull it and go big in the last week of the window for Leal. Yeah. Miguel Delaney still putting that link out there and the Anthony Gordon one. Um, I, again, Dan, nothing against him. I know he scored and pushed a coach. Uh, so he got an, he got an XB over the weekend, but you know, yeah, it, true. the numbers and the dollars, like all he's saying is, is just, crazy to us especially when you have the Callum and there's other opportunities in the transfer window potentially but um you know i i do think that if zaha comes into chelsea's dressing room he probably quiets down a little bit and you're thinking that he would not be a destabilizing force i would probably agree with that because you're upping the level of talent that he's playing with and i think the frustration he seems to have typically tends to be with like the why does nobody else want to help me? Like, why have I, cause he's been a talisman for that team for a very long period of time. And obviously they have a couple new players like in uh, Olise and Eze who definitely, I think uh, make life a little easier on him. So I feel like he's starting to maybe to enjoy football a little more, but I think where you're seeing the connection is that he has less than a year remaining on his contract. That uh, was a contract that he's tried to get out of multiple times and force a move elsewhere. Uh, you know, uh, not maybe as publicly as some players, uh, no Instagram stories to speak of, even though there are some fun photoshops of it. But I think in this regard, Zaha feels like maybe it's just a, too little too late to potentially get done. I do like the shout for Liao. And I think the one with Gordon is to me feels like you looked at like what happened with Bowen at West Ham and you're like, I think he's on the statistical trajectory uh, what happened to Bowen where he had an ability to go from really, you know, good performances to being a very, very competent right wing player in that setup. And you're saying, are we potentially buying into Gordon on an overpay to get him the year before he blows up? Because if it, he does have a double digit goal and assist season in him this year, he could be worth 70, 80, 
90 million pounds next season. Sure, because that's the rate of the inflation in the you know, the transfer market. And it's the value of someone who's a English player because there is a premium there. So look, uh, Sam, our good friend, CFC Central, put a good post together that's on his Substack about why Anthony Gordon, why would Chelsea be after him? I think there are elements to his game, but I do like the idea that if you're going to go with somebody pay maybe more now for someone who's proven that they can get multiple tackles and assist in the season, uh, potentially do it as a part of a campaign to win a title within a, their respective league and respective country. That seems like a really good shout. And the Obama Yang one to me has to be a very, very expensive short term loan. It is a bridge loan to get you into next season to go after who you really want, whether that's potentially buying back Tammy after him having a very successful season now in Roma or, you know, going after uh, Nkuku or others. Like there's a lot of options that will become available next window. And you don't want to tie yourself down to Brandon, like a three-year deal potentially with a bombing where you're, you know, now stuck with him, stuck with high wages and don't have the same flexibility because that's part of being able to be nimble in the window is also having flexibility because your deals aren't hamstringing you uh hamstringing you as it was with like a you know Barkley still sitting on the books you know where you have tons of money on someone who doesn't even play isn't even featured in the plans and it might be better just to figure out how you cut and run yeah uh, you know deal making at its finest um you know three-year plan five-year plan is is just as important as the one-year plan you know and and not essentially making rash de decisions now that are going to affect the the squad balance and and uh composure uh or composition you know down the road bully's got a 10-year deal at a minimum it is written into the agreement he can't burn himself in the first couple of years and flip it uh, and so he has to take that long-term approach to some of these deals i think my guess is pulik sick will stay uh it sounds like hudson to leverkusen there was a lot of talk about that even a few days ago about getting done um it's gone quiet i think it's because the weekend and matches and things were happening kind of took over the news cycle so we'll probably hear monday tuesday obviously because the window closes after wednesday um if he's going to make that move and then ziesh to ajax potentially so there's definitely a couple that need to come in if you lose both ziesh and hudson adoy and so something's going to happen and we just have to wait to see again abameyang we, I joked in the in the chat. Can we take him at one and a half years? Do we? Can we make sure we don't do two? Um, but it, it, this is a lot of posturing. And and at the end of the day, it looks like Barcelona have registered all their players, so I think they are okay as On far a as personal it guarantee. A uh, personal guarantee. It is the most absurd thing. I personally, it's like the Michael Scott. I declare bankruptcy. Laporta, I personally guarantee that is exactly what he did in the La Liga offices. I will find the video. There has to be video of it. There's in in that place. There's definitely video of it somewhere. Um, anyways, just real quick, I think we can just touch again on the fact that midfielders ain't gonna happen. Uh, good to see Kova. Uh, I wonder what's gonna happen with Conte and Jorginho both out of contract. Um, Billy is nowhere to be found. I actually went back and I was browsing our TikTok and saw the Matt Law, you know, kind of discussion and how he feels bad for Billy hasn't been given a squad number, how he's treated in preseason. You know, he, the least Chelsea can do is find him a home, you know, again, Scotland going to the world cup for the first time ever question mark. It's either first time or second time, you know, it, it's been decades since they've gone and he wants to be a part of, of those plans as well. So at a minimum, don't, don't shelve him, you know, find, find him somewhere to go. He's not an expensive player. Like take care of the kid or the lad, the wee lad is, is, is appropriate. Um, but any midfield discussions other than the fact that it still was okay yesterday. All right. Love it. it we're just going to crutch our way through the season with what we've got. Uh, Dan, let's go ahead and pivot to your Dan of the match. Glad to have you back, sir. Glad you didn't have to take this weekend off. Well, look, it's uh, we don't run it when we lose. And so that's just uh, we, we don't run it when we have terrible draws. We, we try to kind of channel into the positivity. And look, it was a tight one. I don't know if I agree with the end result, but uh, this is, the people have spoken. 
39% said Raheem Sterling was their winner. Silva had 29.5. That would have been my choice. But again, the people have spoken. Wesley Fofana, shock, 18%. Just really coming out of the gate. Not even officially signed and doing the work. Oh, really? That's tampering, Dan. James. <laughs> that is tampering. Look, uh, I had fun with it. You have to have a little fun with these things. And then uh, Reese James with uh, 14% of the uh, total poll as well. So Yeah, all fun and games until we receive an injunction from Leicester City Football Club. So thanks for that. I'm going to have to spin up the, the legal fees again. Uh, yes, because they're listening to the American Chelsea podcast. Hey. Uh, these Yankee doodles, what are they doing? Hey, my, my thing is you score two goals and you win, you're always going to get it, right? The fact that... Sterling got it. it. Should really be no surprise. All right. Goals sell man of the match bowls. You know this. All right. I just had a different view. That's all. All right. Um, so if we look around uh the Premier League, there's some interesting results. Tottenham are playing force right now, uh, Tottenham up, but uh Man United apparently in fine, fine form with two wins in a row, beating Southampton one nothing. Uh Brighton beating Leeds one nothing. So we should fear the goals, apparently. Uh Man City after being down two nothing come back. Uh aka Erling Holland comes back to win four two. Liverpool dismantling Scott Parker's uh Bournemouth nine nil. Should we pause there real quick? N- nine nil. And uh, I don't know if you heard Scotty's post-match comments. He said he doesn't think uh, this is going to be their low point this season, Ollie. I, what in the world? How do you say that as a manager? Yeah, I mean, he, he said, <laughs> you know, we're, we're fundamentally not equipped to play football at this level. And I'm like, Scott, it's four games, man. Like, you can't just write off your entire squad before the windows even closed. Like, I know Bournemouth are in, they're basically not buying people right because they don't want to make that investment and then have to pay for it later because they feel like they're probably going to go back down it's kind of a norwichism in that sense but like four games in like um uh oily sailor who i follow on on twitter um he's an opter analyst and i'm sure you guys might uh follow as well he said you know bournemouth are already surpassed our 0405 goals conceded figure after four games, it's August, man. Like, it's it's not a good Word. look. Three more than Petr Cech that whole season. They have a negative fourteen goal difference, and they're still in seventeenth. There are teams worse than them. Riddle me that. Um, so as we continue to look around the league, uh, where was I? Uh, Brentford, Everton drawing one one. Uh, Arsenal beating Fulham two one barely. Wolves won, Newcastle won, uh, Villa nil, West Ham won. So I think West Ham getting their first points of the season. And like I said, uh, one nil, Tottenham over Forest uh, with 10 minutes left in the match. So uh, the table's exciting, um, super exciting. If you look at it, Arsenal at top, Man City second, Tottenham third, Brighton fourth. Set up shop, Leeds fifth, Chelsea sixth. Uh, so we're on seven points. Top of the table is 12 points. So you could say we're already five points off it. Uh, bottom of the table, pretty interesting here. So West Ham taking a big jump up with their first win. Uh, you've got Everton in 18th place uh, with two points. Wolves in 19th place with two points. And Leicester City now bottom of the table with only one point. And again, Bournemouth just hanging in there in, 17, in 17th with negative 14 goal difference. The, the one that I will call out as a, I think they absolutely could go down is Villa. I think they have not reinforced at all. They've gotten some money, but they they actually have a worse uh, goal differential than Everton and Wolves. And I think Everton look more likely to reinforce over the next couple of days than they do. They're making, I think, a couple of smart signings. And Frank seems to know how to motivate a side just enough. And I feel like Villa is probably the one that is more likely to drop down there with Lester, if they do not spend this money intelligently and quickly, I think you could see Lester, Bournemouth, and Villa going down as the as the three. Look with Villa, they're that meme poking with a stick and say do something. I mean, they Stevie G <laughs> odds on to get sacked, uh, probably for me. So, uh, look, 
far too early to take any real readings of anything, Ollie, especially when you kind of look at the strength of schedule, which is a huge thing in like the NFL and, and all of their fans. Arsenal have had like a, a one for their strength of schedule. I mean, just walk in the park and some of the, the lowest of the teams barely getting by this weekend as well. But uh, City showing that they can come back after we've already kind of laughed them off. Liverpool, we, you know, we're saying they're struggling. They just bang nine in against Bournemouth, but, you know, not a big litmus test there either. So um, we're starting to kind of see some interesting things settle. But when, you, you know, majority of the tables on single digit points, a lot can move week to week. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, nine goals, right? I mean, uh, you're talking about maybe the the bottom five around them all together have a combined better goal difference than them. <laughs> um, so yeah, all at the bottom of the table. So yeah, I mean, in terms of Arsenal, uh, it's pretty risky to go on record, but to me, I would say they're kind of like an elephant stuck up a tree. It's like, you don't know how they got there, but at some point it's going to fall. Right. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I'm looking at that. City are just city. They're ominous. Um, the Holland thing is quite interesting in terms of how they're, having to adapt tactically to just be kind of playing through him and only him. Uh, it's quite interesting to watch. I think that might play to their Champions League uh, kind of peril as well, because if you remember Barcelona with Ibrahimovic, there was a kind of similar plug and play aspect with him about his quality there and it kind of ended up souring a bit. But um, yeah, maybe Holland will will do better there. But yeah, it is early season. And as you said, like this is this is a season like no other. Like this is the easy stage now. The first four games, easy street. After this, you've got midweek, every week to the World Cup. You've got the World Cup with, you know, sociopaths like Deschamps uh, in charge of your players. And then <laughs> off the back of that, you're going to have a bunch of players who haven't played for a month, a bunch of players who have played like every day for a month. And then there's going to be a preseason before coming back at Christmas. Like people don't understand how crazy the season's going to be. It's almost like two seasons in one, right? So whoever's top going into the World Cup, they're going to basically have to hope to, to hold that form through the World Cup and their players come back fit and then start again from Christmas. Like this is going to be an absolutely stupid season. And some of the results already, like just from the various fitness levels throughout the league have already shown like depth is going to be crucial versatility is going to be crucial subs are going to be crucial and we're just going to have to see the most intelligent managers come to the fore all yeah, right well to key wrote the rotation key with subs key with using every member of your squad to be a part of it which i think is why clearing out some of the options so that you reduce down bad choices like, look, sometimes when you're, you know, dieting, right, Brandon, like you, you know, you don't buy cookies and leave them up in the cupboard, right? You just, you don't have them in your house. Uh, you put a healthy snack in its place. And so, uh, you know, get maybe the Ross Barkleys or others just out of the area. So Tuchel is prevented from making uh, a, a bad decision. Yeah, like gluten-free cookies, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Okay, going. cool. Um, well, before we wrap, Dan, uh, a new thing, Ishan, uh, on the team wants us to start doing is the loan heat check. So we've got a couple updates on some of our loan army performers. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't have to look much further than uh, Brighton being uh, in the top four at the moment. And uh, Potter's men continuing to uh, look like they're in very fine form at the start of the season. And Levi Cole getting his first opportunity to start uh, this past Wednesday. It was against Florida Screen Rovers in the Carabao Cup. Uh, he kept the clean sheet. Uh, played the ball up for the first goal. He was able to uh, come on for the last 10 of Leeds as well, which uh, again, you know, we, we know as someone who's played Leeds recently that they like to press you for the entirety of the match. And so you're getting the opportunity to come in in the last 10 minutes. And that's a reflection of that. There's some trust there to be able to secure and uh, not do something uh, inherently stupid to, uh, to give it up in the last 10. So I think that's a lot of uh, early trust there from Potter, which you would hope would see him potentially, get opportunities to start in um in the premier league in the uh, very very near future yeah again potter's not going to disrupt what's working but the fact that he's going to be brought on and, and start to get some minutes is is good and he can just show his quality uh then second up is actually tino andrew and ollie uh two goals in a man of the match performance uh while on loan at huddersfield 
Obviously, he's had a bunch of injuries and things like that, but the goal he took this weekend was a beaut. Yeah, I mean, uh, both goals were were really nice. Actually, um, big XBs in the in the build up to the second goal just uh, kind of cleared the defender out into the hoardings right there, and then uh, ran through and put it top bins. Um, but the first goal, if you've not seen it, definitely look it up. Uh, he scored like twenty five yards, just picked his spot top right, curled it from uh, the corner of the box there. He's coming off a preseason where, um, like a few of our squad, uh, they've basically hired a personal trainer to hit the ground running, and he looks like super ready to go. Like he looks like he's going to absolutely dominate that league. Very, very excited. So again, more loan updates throughout the season. We're going to make sure we get this comprehensive coverage uh, of the club. But that's going to wrap us up. Lester match review in. The bucket. We are done. Ship it off. Everyone out there. Hope you enjoyed it. More content coming at you. We got Chelsea women. Uh, we got some other kind of specials that are coming around. Nick is in London. So he's going to be doing some recordings with people as well. I know Ollie, you're probably going to get to meet up with him. Uh, and so a lot of fun content coming out this week as usual. So, anyways, that's going to wrap us up. Huge thank you to Ollie for joining us. But until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do? Get the blue flag flying high. <laughs>